if you uh, have your scripture with you, you can open it up to the book of Luke, chapter 24. Our scripture today comes from Luke 24. We are, we are beginning a, a uh, sermon series in the book of Acts, and so of course it makes complete and total sense to begin with the end of Luke, um, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But uh, our scripture comes from Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 36, going through verse 49. Would you listen for the word of God? While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones. As you see, I have. And when he had done this, said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they were still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate it in their presence. And he said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in His name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray? Father God, truly it is your word this morning that we need to hear. And so we ask, Lord, that you send your spirit upon us, that you open our, our ears and open our hearts to receive your word, to hear what you are saying to us this morning, Lord. And then, Lord, to shape us in accordance with what you are doing in our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I said it should make total sense. Some of you might still be wondering, why would we start a, a, a certain series in the book of Acts by going to the book of Luke? Well, Acts and Luke were both written by the same person, so who was not uh, one of the twelve, but, uh, but was a doctor, and did some thorough investigation into the, the, the stories that he had been told of Jesus. That is, he went and he interviewed person upon person upon person and said, what, what did you see when you were with Jesus? What, what did he say to you? What did he do? And, and Luke, being a, a doctor, very, very analytical, wrote it down in detail to tell us um, first about who Jesus was. And then, beginning in the book of Acts, who the church is, who the body of Christ continues to be after Jesus returned to heaven. And so that's, that's where we're, we're Luke, um, Luke chronicled the works of Jesus and he chronicled the works of the Spirit through the church early on. And that perspective helps us to know who we're going to be as God's people in the world today. Uh, he he is, is ending the, the gospel here with a couple of post-resurrection occurrences. But the most familiar one to people is the, is the walk to Emmaus. You, you guys know this story. There are two disciples and they, and they don't hear about Jesus' resurrection. They're walking to Emmaus, which is, which is some distance away from Jerusalem. And this guy just comes up and starts walking. He says, hey, what are you guys talking about? And they said, oh, what, have you been living under a rock? I mean, this, this guy was, was amazing. His name was Jesus. We thought he was the chosen one, the Messiah. But he's dead now. And we don't know what to do. And as they walked along the road, Jesus said, you know, you know, did you guys read your Bible or, or, or go to Sunday Saturday school? I guess it was a Jewish Sabbath, though. Um, that these things were written about Jesus. 
that he had to suffer these things and be raised on the third day. And he explained the gospel to them. And then they stopped for the night, and Jesus made as if to go, to go on, like he was going further. And they said, no, no, well, please stop. We're going to buy you some dinner. And it says, as they sat down at the table, and Jesus blessed the bread and broke it, their eyes were open, and they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. And then they, Jesus disappeared from their sight. He just was gone. And they ran back to Jerusalem and said to, to the disciples, You guys will not believe this. We were on the road and this guy just came up and, and all this stuff happened. And our hearts were just burning inside of us while we talked. And then that's where this story picks up. The disciples said, Yeah, we know. He was here too. But... Um, but it seems even though all of the disciples have now seen the risen Jesus, and, and as they gather in the room to kind of corroborate their stories they, 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 and witness to one another, there's still this lingering doubt. Is it really possible that Jesus could be back? That the worst that we had, had thought happened had not, in fact, happened? That something more amazing, something completely unexpected happened. That Jesus was alive again. And it's in that moment that once again, as they discuss and wrestle with these, with these doubts and with their hopes and dreams, Jesus shows up in person, in the flesh, in the midst of them. Jesus is preparing His church in the last 40 days uh, in between his, his resurrection and His ascension. He's preparing the church for the mission that God has prepared or has, has placed in advance for them. He's preparing them to accomplish the mission. And he does it with a, a few things. The first of all, the first thing he does is that he prepares them with his very presence. I, I didn't intentionally go through and pick out a bunch of key words, but they are. And the first one is presence. God shows up in the midst of His people when they gather, in person, with His very presence, to inspire us, to hold us together, to, uh, to give us a, a new perspective on, on life and where we're going. Jesus doesn't let the rumor mill be the only vehicle for spreading the word that He's alive. He shows up in person. And Jesus shows up in person today. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Jesus knows that we humans are finite. And we need something to hold on to. That, that we can't live in the realm of philosophy forever. But that we need something that we can touch. Something that we can see. Something that we can taste. If we're truly going to believe something is real. You know, you can believe in a chair all your life. But until you actually sit in the chair, you haven't made that belief real. Until you actually physically touch the chair, say, yeah, this is a chair. It's going to hold me. It's just a philosophical abstraction. And Jesus gives us the physical touch, the physical presence that we need. It says that um, when He shows up, they were startled and frightened, thinking that they saw a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do you doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. You know, I think it's significant. Jesus doesn't belittle his disciples for doubt. He doesn't give them a bad time. Come on, you guys. I, I walked with you on the road of maze. You remember that? I was here in the room just a couple of days ago. Do you guys remember that? He doesn't give them a bad time. He doesn't roll his eyes and say, oh, all right, here's my hand. He's open. He's willing to give himself to his disciples. He knows that it's important that they, that they see him. He offers himself to inspection willingly. You know, it's important that we're looking at a physical resurrected Christ here. That he's not a ghost. That he's not just a feeling. That he's not just a spirit. There are people who call themselves Christians today who don't believe this. They say, you know, Jesus, he died. It was an unfortunate thing. After he died, his disciples gathered and they said, you know, 
It's almost as if he's still with us. I get this Jesus feeling. And that that is what they termed the resurrection experience. A, a kind of intangible, you know, I still feel grandma's looking down on me from above. Kind of experience. But what we believe in, in this church, what is gospel Christian belief, is that Jesus rose from the dead for real in a physical body, in a resurrected body, and that he appeared to his di disciples, and that we too have the promise someday of rising from the dead in a resurrected, glorified body, of meeting one another. We're not just spirits who are trapped in flesh for a little while. We are people who are, are given by God, made in his image, as both spiritual beings and physical beings. Our physical side is good. It's broken, but it's good. And God uh, acknowledges that. When he said this, verse 40, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have something here to eat? You know, I find this is a really strange passage. I mean, we have all of these disciples have now witnessed the resurrected Jesus. They walked with him. The, 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 the two on the road in Emmaus ate with him. The others in the upper room saw him. Thomas got to touch his hands and, and side. We know that, that they had experienced the resurrected Christ. And yet, it says, they still had doubts. Jesus is there in the flesh. He lets the disciples touch him. And they still say, really? Are you serious? You know... There are times when we, we just can't believe when something so good has happened. That we just, our, our mind just can't wrap itself around that fact. You know, I remember this happened with all four of my kids. First with Imani. We went all the way to Kenya. We spent months in Kenya. We went through the adoption process. We, we picked up our little peanut. She was just a little thing at the time. And, um, and did all the paperwork, waited for endless days in the line at the embassy. And then finally the, the time came to go and get on the plane and go through all these customs checkpoints and security checkpoints and, you know, all the way through in, in the airport in, in Nairobi, in the airport in Washington, D.C., in the airport uh, back here in the, state, in, in the West Coast. And that whole time, I kept thinking, you're going to take this baby from me? You know, is she really mine? All these guys, they've got gadgets. Are they going to want this baby back? I couldn't believe, I couldn't wrap my mind around the fact that she was really ours. And it was such a wonderful thing. And then, I mean, it was just crazy that it happened again to me with Andrew when he was born in Pittsburgh. On the way out of the hospital, I'm thinking, are they really going to take her? Let us take this thing home with us? I mean... I haven't been, I haven't, they haven't done a background check on me or anything. Are they sure about this? <laughs> but sometimes the, the, the events in our life are just so amazing that we have a tough time wrapping our mind around it. Don't ever let those moments of doubt that you have in your life, don't ever let them make you feel like you should be disqualified. From, from the, the work of faith. Don't ever let those doubts make you feel unworthy of your faith. You can see the risen Jesus in front of you and still say, really? God, do you really love me this much? Are you really willing to give your son and to, and to bring him back from the dead for my sake? If the disciples did, don't think any less of yourself when you have doubts. The problem is not with the truth that has been revealed to us. That the truth somehow isn't good enough. That we haven't been proven. It hasn't been uh, convincing enough. Sometimes the problem is just that our minds can't conceptualize something so way. So the next time you have doubts, don't beat yourself up. The question is not whether you'll have doubts. It's when you have doubts. Are you going to be willing to stick with Jesus through those doubts to, to the point that he will come and reveal himself again and say, hey, it's really me. I really love you that much. God, my Father, really loved you so much that he gave me. 
Stick with it through the night. Verse 42. So Jesus asks, you got anything to eat? And, uh, and they gave him a piece of broiled fish. It's a pretty mundane thing. You know, not a communion way for something holy. It's just a piece of fish. And he took it and ate it in their presence. We humans need something to grab hold of. And Jesus strengthens his disciples by showing them some plain old, mundane, ordinary proof. That's the second thing he gives them. Proof. And, and it's interesting that the way he chooses to give them the proof, he doesn't give them a reasoned argument right away. He just sits down at the table with them. And he has a meal. And sometimes the, the, the doubts that we have are dispelled in the most ordinary of times. Since, since just being there doesn't seem to be enough to revive their faith, he, he just does an ordinary human fleshly thing. He, he has a meal. He has a lunch. Jesus knows that we are human. And once again, he shows himself to be solid, real, reliable in an ordinary way. He meets his disciples at the table. Do you ever think about this bread up here in this cup? Why we don't use some special holy bread? I mean, we just go down to the store and we buy a loaf of bread. We get some Welch's and we put it in, in the cup. It hasn't been triply blessed. It hasn't been, you know, baked in a, in a special oven. It's just bread and it's just juice. Do you ever think about baptism? I mean, when we do a baptism here in the church, we go to the tap, we turn it on, and we baptize somebody. When we do it at Jeff, well, we got some pretty special water there, but, you know, it's a little fishy. So, um, and cool. God meets us in amazing ways, and He does it through ordinary means. Okay? Ordinary bread. But what we believe in the church is that when we meet for communion, and we break that bread, and we take that cup, and we share that meal as a family, we believe that God, by His Holy Spirit, shows up. Talk about it in theological terms, the real presence of God. That this stays ordinary bread, but that it becomes for us the very flesh of God. It's ordinary bread, but God Himself enters into our lives when we take communion. God Himself seals us by His Holy Spirit when we go into the waters of baptism. They're ordinary things, and God does the extraordinary. We, we turn those things sacraments. And I want to talk about you guys being sacramental people. Because that's what God is preparing these people here in the end of Luke and into the book of Acts to be. A sacramental people. Ordinary Christians. Ordinary Christians who are made extraordinary by the purpose that God has given them. I just stole that book from Oswald Chambers who wrote the, the Maya Post for his highest. All of Christ, God's people, all Christians, are ordinary people. But as God sends us into the world, in the power of His Spirit, we ordinary people interact with other ordinary people and God does something amazing when He shows up. He changes lives. He changes hearts. He heals people. He makes them whole again. He washes away sin. He transforms this world through the power of ordinary people. Sacramental. Verse 44, he said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, and the prophets, and the Psalms. So Jesus does also take this moment for, uh, for a lesson. He says, once again, get out your scriptures, open them up. Let's, let's talk about what, what scripture told, said about me, that this had to happen. Um, I, I was just reading something the other day that said there are some, something like 2,000 references to Christ in the Old Testament. And, and there's a lot of them that talk about Him dying and coming back from the dead. 
he, he gives them an opportunity to take what they already know from Scripture and to put it into a new perspective. I can imagine that, that reading those Sunday school lessons is a little bit different when Jesus himself is standing in front of you. When, when you've got the physical evidence, not just some prophet's word for it, um, but they've got the risen Jesus sitting with them. And the same words that, that they had read all, all through their childhoods and, and, uh, and the same words that Jesus had told them over and over again while they walked with him uh, across Galilee now suddenly make a different kind of sense because he puts them in perspective. Verse 45, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, this is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. This, this new perspective that they give, uh, that they're given from, from Jesus, this new perspective that, that they can put these old verses in a new light, uh, this new perspective is, is most amazing as, the, as Jesus unfolds God's plan for his people through the world. The events in the disciples' lives, the events in our lives, are part of a bigger plan that God is, is making happen. Even now. This, if this wasn't just a, a chance event that, that somehow the bad guys got, got the upper hand for a moment, but that, that God you know, pulled off a last minute victory. This was planned. God works even in terrible things. To bring about an amazing, triumphant plan. And that plan is nothing less than the salvation of this world. The transformation of your life, of my life, of, of your neighbor's lives. God is active. He's working out a plan that encompasses all creation. And then he says to, to, to his disciples, you are witnesses of these things. What's a witness? I mean, witness is, is somebody who sees something, right? Well, that's one definition of what a witness is. Somebody who's, you know, I saw the car, hit the other car, so I'm a witness. But when you think of it in, in the broader sense, like a legal sense, a witness is a person who gives testimony to what they've seen. The, the Greek word for witness is marturos. Um, sound familiar? It's the, it's the root word of, of the word martyr. People who, who gave the witness, their testimony with their very lives. Jesus says, you guys are witnesses of these things. What, what things are these? Well, that, that Christ had to suffer and was risen from the dead. That it had to happen because God is at, is at work saving the world. And, and that all of the disciples are going to be sent out from Jerusalem to witness to the world that God actually cares. That, that a people who were living in darkness would know that God himself loves them so much that he would give his only son. God cares enough about your neighbor. And God cares enough about your boss. And God cares enough about your students. And God cares about, enough about your friends. And God cares enough about your family that he gave his one and only son. Let him go to the cross. For their sake, that they might be saved and that they might have life, that they might be transformed and healed and whole again. And what, like the disciples, we are sent as witnesses with a purpose in this world. It's not just that God had a plan and that it's kind of neat and we can sit back now in our Christian easy chairs, our Christian lazy boys, and watch it take shape in front of us, but that we are given a purpose in our lives. I'm thinking of uh, the book uh, of Esther. You know the book of Esther, the, the beauty queen? She was uh, chosen to be the new king, uh, new queen, excuse me, the new queen. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and she thought that was it. Well, great, okay, I'm going to be a queen and, and live in this palace. And um, Okay, not much going on. Until her entire people were, were threatened with extinction. Um, there was a guy, Haman, he hated the Jews. 
and he wanted them all dead. Well, he hated it in particular Mordecai, but he wanted all the Jews dead. And there was nobody who would speak up for the Jews. There, the king had already signed the, the execution order. They were all going to be killed. And, and Mordecai, Esther's cousin, went to her and he said, who knows? Who knows but that you have been put where you are for just such a time as this. Nobody else can do this best. Nobody else can step in and speak to the king and save our people. Only you. You know, each one of us is an Esther. We've been given a destiny. God has claimed you not just to be his own and sit back and wait while he does the rest of the, the, the work, but to be a part of his work in salvation. He's given you a destiny. There's somebody in your life that nobody else is meeting right now. Nobody else cares enough about that person. And you've been given that person. You've been placed in their life for just such a time as this, a purpose in God's plan. God is preparing you for that, just like you prepared Esther, just like he prepared his disciples. Finally, verse 49, I'm going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. God doesn't send us out unequipped into this world. When you step into this other person's life, this person that only you can touch, God's not going to leave you hanging there. God has given each one of us the gifts that we need for the purpose he's given us. And in particular, he's, he's telling his, his disciples to wait because he's going to send the Holy Spirit on us and that we can just trust God as he walks each and every step of the way with us through our life to do his plan. You know, I, I, um, I think there's a big difference between waiting, as he tells his disciples here, and retiring. And the modern church has a, has a tendency to, to look kind of more towards the retiring. Like, awesome, Jesus is great, he's done this amazing thing, I give my life to Christ, and now I can sit back and wait until the, until the end times, or until I die, and then get all the really good stuff. That's not waiting, that's not what Jesus is telling his disciples, and that's not at all what he ever meant for his church. I, I'm thinking more in terms of well, you guys watch the Summer Olympics. I, I love the Summer Olympics. Um, I could do without so much beach volleyball, um, but but I love uh, you know the gymnastics is always fun. But I, my most especially I love the sprints because I, I was a sprinter in high school and and I just still get so excited as I watch the the, the runners line up and they, they put their fingers down on the that right behind that line their feet back in those blocks, you know? And then, well, I, I mean, I, I remember them saying set. I don't know what they were saying at the Olympics. Maybe they were talking Chinese or something. Sound. And the runners kind of pop up. They're waiting. Are they relaxed? No. No, they are waiting, poised for the moment that that gun sounds and they can spring out of those blocks because they know that a good start means the race. And I still, well, I, I get this adrenaline surge as I watch the, the, the runners line up at the line. That, I think, is the picture of the end of Luke in the beginning of Acts when the Holy Spirit comes to God's people. The church is like this. Okay, God, you've got something for us. We know, God, that, that, that you're with us. You've shown us by your presence with us that you are real and that you're here. You, we've seen the proof. Even though we sometimes doubt, we've seen the proof. Enough so that we're going to get through these doubts. We know, Lord, we've been given a new perspective on the world, a new perspective on what you're doing, and a new perspective on who we are. We know that you've got a plan for us, the church, and a plan that includes this world outside. I, I was so excited to, to see so many of you at the block party yesterday. I think that's part of God's plan. God's church reaching out to the neighborhood. If we don't care about the neighborhood, we don't care about God. So, so God's got a plan. We know that. We know that we individuals have purpose 
in this plan. That we are a part of it. That we're partners with God in what He's doing. And that He's going to give us the power to accomplish it. And so we stand poised and ready for that moment that the gun sounds and God catapults us into His mission. I pray that this church seizes sees hold of that kind of vision of what God is doing in your life, of how He is shaping you to run His race. And I pray that as we get into some amazing, awesome stuff in the book of Acts, that you will be asking yourself the questions about where you fit into this plan, about how God is using you to shape this plan. Okay. Oh God, you are amazing. You're awesome. Your love is amazing, Lord, and the way you have poured yourself out upon the people to save an undeserving people, Lord, from their sin and to make them partners with you in transforming this world. We ask, Lord, that you transform this church, that you make us attentive to your voice, that you pour your spirit out upon us in power, Lord, that we might be responsive to the needs of this world. We ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Son. Your Son. Amen.